Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our own mortality and penitence. So we may remember that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, our Lenten journey begins tonight. It's a journey, as you know, to the other side of the cross. There we find the empty tomb. There we find the resurrected Lord. And there, of course, we find unrestrained joy. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Our Lenten journey begins with ashes. You, since Old Testament times, Ashes are a self-imposed mark of humiliation, an outward sign of an in, inner repentance. They are a mark of sin and death, a reminder to us that our bodies, even the bodies of babies, will return to the dust from which the human race was first taken. But ashes or no ashes, the fact is we already wear the marks of death on our faces. I mean, we attempt to cover it up, but it's evidenced in every wrinkle, every age spot. We have it in our glasses to help protect imperfect, or correct rather, imperfect eyes. We have it in the gray hair and we have it in the bald head. And all our frailties and our infirmities, our bent over backs, our weak limbs. Beloved, we're dying. We suffer the consequence of sin. Remember how the Lord told Adam and Eve, in the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely what? Die. Die. Did death come to them immediately? No. But death came. It's called original sin, by the way. Death is coming for all of us and it's going to track us down. And it's going to squeeze every bit of life out of you. And then your breathless body will return to the dust return in judgment to the ashes. The gravity of this is why men of old, when they greeted one another, they wouldn't say, how are you doing with the other person saying, fine. That's what we say. They would greet one another with the words, memento mori. Memento mori. And the other person would say, memento mori. And it means, remember, that you must die. Remember. Memento mori. We might say something like, uh, on akin to seize the day. Something to that effect. Memento mori. This is why a lot of times in ancient paintings, not really ancient, but other paintings you would see depicted, uh, somebody would do a still, still life. You know what this is. They would place flowers and vases and, and maybe even glass cups. They would place all kinds of things on, on a table and they would draw it. And more times than not, there was a skull. Why? Memento mori. That in all of the beauties of life, whether it be the beauties of flower, whether it be the delicacies of food, whatever it might be, the artist is saying, remember, you too must die. Memento mori. 
And this is what we recall on Ash Wednesday. Yet even with ashes on our forehead and these changes in our body, what reminds us best of our weaknesses and our limitations and sin and impending death is the law of God, which shows us that we've wandered off. We, like sheep, have gone astray. You all know what the law of God is. It's been written on your hearts already, instilled in your very conscience, but there it's still a little fuzzy. It's hard to make out. So I remind you, you shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You know, you hear His law, and then we see our deeds, and we realize these two things are not the same. And thus you're left shattered, accused, filleted, guilty. For starters, you have let the world entice you away from regular attendance at church and become lazy with family devotions and with prayer. Your spending reflects greater commitment to the world than to the kingdom of God. Hence our gospel lesson telling us about moths that eat and rust that corrodes and thieves that steal. And your stuff, all of it, will eventually be sold in a yard sale. And what's not will sometime later be tossed out in the rubbish heap. It doesn't even make the yard sale. Likewise, your prayers have faltered. You really don't have time to pray because trivial, worldly things have taken you away from the things that truly matter. Moreover, your hearts have grown distant and cold, apathetic, really, to spiritual things. When the heart is distant, your worship of God takes on a certain emptiness, a, a certain hypocrisy, even. Instead of repenting over these things, we come up with excuses and denials and self-justifications. Guilty of forgetting our first love. And that's just by looking at commandments 1, 2, and 3. Would you like to go over 4 through 10? Thank you, no. Folks, when you throw yourself against God, it's not God who falls to pieces. It's you. It's me. So repent. Wear the ashes, but do more than just that. Fast, mourn, and weep. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Admit your sin, confess your guilt, and leave nothing hidden. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. But this is not the only thing you need to hear tonight. Yes, the ashes on your forehead remind you of your mortality, memento mori, but the ashes on your forehead are, praise be to God, in the form of cross. The cross of Him whose love for you was so great that He willingly took upon your dust and your ashes born of the Virgin Mary. In so doing, His body fails. He's picked after by mobs. He dies beside thieves. He's stabbed by a, a rusty spear. And yet this is precisely what He came to do, to take that death of yours upon Himself and to be forsaken by God so that you won't have to. You see, if he breaks, if he goes under, we all go under. And if you stop to consider how when Jesus is led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, and when 40 days after fasting, he confronts the devil with the temptations. If he falls there, we all fall. There's not a third Adam. There's our father, Adam who failed in the garden. And now you've got a second Adam, Jesus, who, praise be to God, succeeds, is victorious in the wilderness. 
when they see how all of humanity at that moment, it, like, it, it hung just on the balance right there. If he failed there, and if he failed on that cross, we all go down. Praise be to God, he didn't. Because out of the dread darkness, Jesus cries with a loud voice triumphantly. You know, when you're on a cross hanging down like this for hours after hours, essentially what you do is you drown in your own fluid. Asphyxiation. You drown. You have to push up on your feet just to get a breath. And then, of course, you can't hold yourself there, so you sink back down. Men who are dying on a cross do not shout with a loud voice. Jesus does. And what does he say? It is finished. He's done it. He is through. And then he goes on to make the way for you also through the little death of the grave. And what this means for all of you is... You are free. Your sin is answered for. Your idolatry, your cursing, your disregard of God's word, your dishonoring of your parents and other authorities, every hateful word you've said to make yourself look better than somebody else, all of your sexual sins, your laziness and stealing, you never being content with God's gift and always looking for happiness in what He never gave you. Full atonement has been made. Full and free forgiveness is yours. It's a sheer gift. What put you wrong with God, what separated you from Him is gone, and thus you can return. You can return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. I read it just this past week. When you don't have kind thoughts towards God, and that's been me at times. When you don't have kind thoughts towards God, He has kind thoughts towards you. I know that sounds so juvenile, maybe even elementary. But to hear that this God has kind thoughts towards me, even in those times where I don't have kind thoughts towards Him, that's a God I want to return to. Return unto the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. You know, the ashes that are worn tonight are the same cross that was put on you in holy baptism, reminding you that your mortality is exchanged for His divine life. His divine life, which He has given you to eat and to drink, that medicine of immortality. You have those little boxes that say S, M, T, W, and you pop those bad boys up and you put your pills in it for each day of that week. I've seen my dad do this, usually on Sunday night. Gets all the pills together, <laughs> gets the little box together, sits there and watches television and goes, drops them, drops them in. And then drops that one in. And then drops this one in. Beloved, you've got a box like that, and it says the medicine of immortality. Wow. And it comes out of the side of Christ, and it flows right into that chalice, and that chalice is poured right into you, sustaining you all the days of your life in the one true faith. Finally, consider how the ashes into which you will disintegrate will one day come back. This is unreal. They will come back in a glorified new body on the last day. 
This is one of my favorite tests of Lutherans. When I, especially when I go to their house for the shut-in visits, and I say, and we do the Apostles' Creed together, and it says, I believe in the resurrection of the body. I say, stop! Whose body is that talking about? Oh, the temptation is to say what? Jesus! No. No. In the Apostles' Creed, the Jesus is already ascended and sitting, sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Who's that talking about? That's you! That's your body. That's why you make the sign of the cross at that phrase in the Apostles' Creed or in the Nicene Creed. Why? My body, this body. These ashes will come forth in a new glorified body. And this is true humanity. This is the way that it was always meant to be before the fall. Beloved, death has no right to you in Christ. Not now, and not forever. For you belong to Jesus. Death for Jesus was like trying to keep a beach ball underwater. And death is the same way for you. As Adam would say, the Lord my creator took me as dust from the earth and formed me into a living being, breathing into me the breath of life. God honored me, setting me up as ruler. Imagine that, Adam was king of the earth. Adam says, God set me up as ruler over all things visible and made me the companion of angels. But Satan the deceiver, using the serpent as instrument, enticed me by food, parted me from the glory of God and gave me over to the earth and to the lowest depths of the earth. These are the things that Adam would say. But in compassion, our Savior, He calls us back to Him again. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand for the